Good morning. Uh, this is the uh, Embedded Essentials track, and uh, we've had a couple of top talks already yesterday. Uh, today we have a few more talks to do. Hopefully you can you can stay with us for this uh, af after these talks as well. Uh, this morning we have a talk by uh, Skyler Patton on uh, Device Tree, um, and then we were all also going to have a, a talk later on on I squared C and SPI, finishing up with some. Uh, spelunking through hardware schematics and uh, reference manuals, which should be a lot of fun at the end of the day. Uh, but uh, today we're going to start with a device tree. It's a fundamental part of embedded Linux and something that uh, every embedded engineer certainly needs to know a little bit about in order to uh, configure a board or write a driver for the Linux kernel. And on that note, I'll pass it over to uh, Skylar. Uh, thank you, Don. Uh, thank you for attending our, our talk today. Um, I'm going to be talking about, uh, as Bahan mentioned, the uh, device tree and some things that uh, I've learned uh, over the last uh, six, seven, eight years, maybe, of supporting a uh, device tree. Um, so let's uh, go into the next slide here. And um, here's our agenda we're going we're gonna to talk about. I'm going to start off with talking about who I am and, and what I do. And... Um, then we're going to talk about uh, Linux bring up uh, some suggested practices for um, on a derivative based board. And uh, we're going to kind of do a quick refresher on boot flow and see how the device tree uh, is, is used during that, uh, that flow. And then we're going to do, uh, go into discussing what kind of some major components from a, I guess a high level view of looking at how the device tree uh, files put together. And then um, as part of a board bring up, I want to introduce or if this Sorry if it's already been a topic that's been brought up before, but kind of like a hello world concept. Uh, we've always had that, that first line of code we wrote in C was hello world. Well, I want to kind of, and it was, you know, very elementary. So the, the DTS file that we're talking about is going to be very elementary. We just want to make the board basically boot. And so we can prove that the board uh, at least boots Linux. And then um, I'm going to go through the steps that I've used to create a um, this uh, hello world uh, DTS file. And then uh, I want to talk about something important. Why the hello world is important? Uh, why the hello world is important is with uh, the life cycle of the um, LTS kernel, and, uh, and some of the things I've seen over the last few years of um, as people are making products or boards, and as new kernels come out, new features, and they want to to uh, upgrade to that uh, kernel, and why this uh, this hello world might actually help with that process. So let's uh, move on to the. Uh, so who am I? So. I've been working with embedded software at TI for um, for 20 plus years. I'm currently a member of the Satara Processors Linux Applications team, and I've been there since the the product line was uh, I guess created back about 11 years ago. Uh, I support Linux, uh, general Linux, um, but I kind of also do a lot of networking support, and and is what this topic of this presentation is about: board porting uh, on on TI SOCs. Uh, the, Things I'm talking about today are not going to be specific to TI. This is this hello world concept could be used for any um, board that's using a DTS or derivative board that's using a DTS file. Uh, right, that doesn't work. So the target audience for this um, presentation is um, people that are kind of getting uh, introduced to um, to Linux and also, as Bahan mentioned, a uh, an embedded system and how the embedded systems are using DTS files with the kernel to kind of define the non-discoverable uh, components that are on the board. Um, anybody who's always been maybe a higher level application was always kind of interested in to know how all these uh, devices become available on the board, how an SOC is actually what they call bound to the board. Um, this is, again, these are the people I'm hoping uh, will get the most out of this presentation. Um, this uh, to kind of kind of give you some uh, guidelines of how this presentation was put together. Um, this is about a method that I've kind of been using for the last couple of years. When we're kind of help, I'm helping other people bring up uh, the kernel on their boards, and this is stuff that I've come up with. I'm sure there there may be a, a ton of other ways to do it. Um, the uh, key thing I always want to talk about is that with this uh, concept of we'll talking about the whole world later is about we, we just need the kernel to boot initially. This is getting to that initial prompt. Uh, so you have some basic control over the board. This is not a um, like a whole complete turnkey type uh, type uh, discussion because that's that in my mind that's a little too complex. And so I'm trying to simplify the problem because a lot of times when you bring up a board for the first time, there's all kinds of uh, uh, issues that can come up that uh, they 
kind of get you in this debate. Is it my DTS file or is it the, uh, is it the, um, is it my board? Sometimes it's both. Um, I also remember I'm an application engineer. I've done, a, I'm a little bit familiar, obviously quite familiar with the kernel, but I'm not doing this from a, uh, from a kernel developer's point of view. And that's kind of, again, the target audience is that this is your application person. Um, uh, but the stuff I'm talking about would also be kind of critical for anybody who's also going to be, you know, eventually has plans to write device drivers. Um, and so when I was putting this presentation together, I, there's some things I didn't get a chance to go to that actually got going into nodes being very specific. So again, this is kind of a macro level presentation and kind of showing you how the device tree is put together and how um, you can, from a macro level, kind of make sure that certain components are in place. Um, Again, I've made an assumption that everybody's at least heard of what a DTS file is. Um, I'm not. I will. I will go over some of the syntax and, and kind of point out there's a couple of things about uh, appending nodes that's very important for a, a person who's bringing up a board. Um, but um, one recommendation is that the um, that the Free Electrons uh, group or company has put together a great tutorial presentation. That's what I first started looking at, and I still go back to it every once in a while. But um, it's a great presentation. I highly encourage you if you haven't seen it to, to go look at it. And uh, now the next topic is um, making a key point here. So this talk is going to be about bringing up a board that's based on another board. So and the reason why I'm making that distinction is that most of the SOC vendors are going to at least put out some kind of evaluation module. And so through that process, they will have, um, they will have done all that hard uh, lifting. And we'll explain what some of that hard lifting is of getting a lot of the, all that Linux support into place to um, uh, so that your job is trying to bring up this derivative board shouldn't be as complex as what they initially had to do to bring up that full that full evaluation module that they did. And so, um, as I said, is a derivative board that you're uh, that you're um, basing your, your 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 derivative board that you're basing on is going to be from an existing existing board. And there's three possible uh, I call it kind of categories that these uh, these boards could come from. There's the um, Linux community boards that are uh, also based on an SOC vendor board, but the, the first one is most important is that SOC vendor evaluation module has to be taken, it has to be put into place. And the reason is that there's a, there's a processor include file, and we'll get to what that is in a second, that defines everything on that part. So anything after that evaluation module for uh, that original SOC vendor is going to be a derivative board. And uh, another classification I've seen over the years is existing uh, companies that uh, have, have got several boards that they've designed and as they're uh, basing new designs off their original design. And that has usually a, a life cycle, a kernel life cycle um, uh, thing we'll talk about later, but not to keep you in suspense, is it usually like parts go out of, go out of date. And so therefore they have to respin the board. And when they respin the board, sometimes they want to say, okay, there's, maybe it's time to upgrade the kernel. And, um, you know, talk about some more of that later. The uh, block diagram on the left <clears throat> Is, um, is, is a beagle bone black and um, and um, and what I'm trying to represent here is that uh, if you look at the the uh, the processor here in the center you have all these little blocks around the um, around each side of the processor and this is basically all the peripherals that you're attaching to the processor and so there's gonna be as I move along I'll make the distinction between what is the SOC and then what are the peripherals that you're putting on that board and how the DTS helps you define what you've put on the board. And uh, kind of carry this thought for, um, so if you start off with the uh, Beagle Bone Black or any, any processor, and you wanna change that, uh, you decided that, uh, for example, that, okay, that's a great design, but from what I'm trying to do is I wanna add uh, a couple of interfaces and also maybe perhaps take away a couple of interfaces because I don't really need them for what I'm trying to do. And so in this slide here, I'm showing you that, okay, in this particular example, say we want to add another Ethernet port our, on RJ45. We're going to be adding a PHY to go with that and, um, and a couple of UARTs. And then, uh, then we're going to take, what, take away the uh, HDMI. So you've already changed, since you've changed, assuming we've, we're doing this design, you've changed it to the point where you can't just drop in the previous DTS file. So you have to... Um, so you, you probably could and it might work, but um, I've found that sometimes when you just do these minor changes, is anything can go wrong. And also then the board itself could also have some issues. So um, as we go along, we'll talk about how we're going to come back to this hello world, which is I'm going to start with a minimal thing and then I'll add in everything else. So 
So when you're um, looking for an existing design, you're going to make a derivative. Is it? You'll go into the this particular directory here. If, if you can see, it's the Arch ARM boot DTS directory. This is where all the 32-bit ARM DTS files are. And down at the bottom, I show you where the ARM, where the 64-bit versions are. But in that directory, in this particular directory here, there's like over 2,000 DTS files, and I've only kind of snapshotted the ones that uh, I'm going to. Um, just a small brief uh, subset here and i've kind of mostly based it on the 335x which is coming from the um uh, from the you know, that's where the beagle bone black is and so you can see that there's um there's quite a few quite a few boards here and none of these are not, are all not all ti boards some of these are community boards um and then there's a uh, other um i guess people who have based their uh their design on 335x have put their boards in also so the only way you get access to this is if people who have made this decision when they've ported their um, their board have actually decided to actually mainstream it or mainline it and um, and since TI's mainlines it's its boards this is why you see the, the 335x supported but you see a lot of other people decide that too that doesn't mean every any SOC is always going to find it in there probably the, the file would get I mean the directory would probably get really huge but um, but these are the boards you have to choose from when you're making your der derivative design and so that's one of the reasons why you know when the SOC is there you always have that ability to um, you want to leverage a known working design. And um, uh, so like so there's several board vendors here. And this is just a sample of the boards, like I said, in the directory. And um, you always want to start with the, uh, the DTS file of the reference board uh, that you want to look at. And and by starting with a known good, especially if also you've, and I'm going to emphasize this also, you really need that that platform that you're starting with to kind of help you with your uh, your next design. But uh, this is where all the files are stored that you can start with. And as you can see, I actually kind of snapshot a directory that actually has uh, both the uh, the DTS files and actually the compiled versions, which are the DTBs file. All right, so. If you're going to start with your uh, to uh, make your uh, new DTS board, how do you start? And like I was mentioning, if you copy the board exactly, then there's probably no reason to to do that. But it, you know, for argument's sake, you could sit there, you could just drop that that reference DTS file into your new design. Um, you want to completely start over? Um, no, you don't, because you always want to leverage what's there. And um, I so say you're going to start with a DTS uh, version of the of the, the reference board that you're d uh, deriving from. And this is the, so this is a, this is a, just a snapshot of a, and this is a very simple, this is not a full DTS file, but what I want to highlight here is this processor.dts file. So this usually, this is the file that leads off a DTS file. You can actually um, also say that you can actually reference a DTS file here that would eventually come back and still reference a processor DTSI file. In this processor DTSI file, which I'll go into a little bit more details, is basically defining everything that's inside the SOC and why that and, and why that's critical, or not so much critical, but it's it's done for you as a as a derivative uh, uh, developer. So, what are the reasons for developing a Hello World DTS versus a full board DTS? Um, as like I mentioned, as I mentioned before, you can get to uh, this uh, when you're developing when you're debugging a board when you're bringing it up. You can get into this: is it the board or is it my DTS file? And um, the reason why I say that is that sometimes a simple um, semantic error inside your DTS file will actually cause the, the kernel to crash as it boots because the kernel won't be able to parse the um, the DTS file correctly. Um, so therefore, by that, you want to be, make sure you, to reduce the challenge. You want to get to a small, minimal set that just boots the board. You're not trying to bring everything up, in my opinion, at this point. You just want you really just need a console, a root file system, then the memory and the, and the kernel to actually be loaded into memory. Uh, by going with the minimal interface set, um, if you can get to that, um, once you can get to a prompt, then there's all the utilities within Linux that allows you to kind of help, uh, kind of debug interfaces. So, for example, say you're having, um, uh, lack of better, you say you're having Ethernet trouble. Um, if you can get to a prompt and you've got the Ethernet node in the DTS file, you could, you know, start using some of the uh, if config, you know, eth tool utilities to try and help you kind of find things also uh, what's going wrong. You can also use like Phi tool to maybe talk to the Phi to see, if, for, for example, what's going on with the Phi. And that's usually when you're at that level, that's when you're trying to debug uh, something on the board. So by getting to that, getting to, getting to that base prompt, 
you can um, you can use leverage all those utilities to be able to find out that you can maybe run something kind of diagnostic on the board at the Linux level um, that uh, might help you with trying to understand what's going on with some other part that's getting some kind of hardware uh, conflict or issue. Um, debugging a DTS is uh, that is not semantically correct is a pain and um, I, there may be some other techniques, but usually this is why, again, I'm, when I talk about the whole world, I'll, I'll point out why. Is it, again, if you just miss, you know, if you, you miss the hierarchy just a little bit and it, it could cause all kinds of problems. So if you start with a really small DTS file rather than the full blown reference one, you, you uh, I think it will alleviate a lot of pain as you bring up a board. And then the other reason is, um, and I'll, again, I'll highlight this several times, is that upgrading kernels will be easier with a minimal uh, base DTS. And the reason is, and I'll point out later, is this processor DTSI file that I mentioned is the most likely file that's going to be changing the most. And it could just be one release, two releases, but a lot of times, say, for example, people are maybe in two years, they decide they want to upgrade the kernel. And that DTS file will no longer even compile under uh, that new new kernel version, probably. Or if it does compile, it could be, you know, there could be some kind of hidden um, uh, semantic error uh, that I've seen uh, before that things didn't line up correctly anymore inside the uh, inside the DTS file. So as I was mentioning, what is initial success? So when I've been bringing up boards or with working with uh, people bringing up their boards, we want to get to that prompt because once we get to that prompt, it means we have a working kernel. We have access to the uh, to the file system. We have access to all the perhaps all the, the uh, other utilities we can use to kind of help us. And also, it's a, it's it's always good to be able to get to a baseline. So once you get to that prompt, you've got a baseline of saying, "Hey, I've got uh, I can actually use the kernel to help uh, with additional uh, debug features." And to get to that prompt, you're going to need a kernel and a, the, the new custom DTB for your your drive board and a root file system, and um, and obviously a, a UART console. And so not all the peripherals have to be enabled. So if you're you've got like six UARTs, you really only need that one for that console, and you can bring them in individually. Or say you're having trouble with an I squared C device, you don't have to bring in all the I squared C at once. Is it you can kind of add all these things uh, iteratively, and that's again I want to. Uh, highlight is during a board bring up typically it's I always think it's a good idea to kind of do these things in an iterative fashion and uh, that way you're just working on one interface rather than this whole you know a, you know huge one complete um, uh, all entitled full entitlement type DTS you will I think you'll be able to be a lot more efficient by doing it one piece at a time it might seem a little bit slow but this is something I, I found has been uh, very helpful So a quick review of booting. So we need to talk about how the kernel and the DTP get together. Um, as, as, as part of this talk, I, I want to, I think I mentioned, you mentioned it again probably, is that we're expecting a bootloader of some kind. So typically U-Boot's used. And so this is kind of a, this is a very generic boot flow diagram. So you have a, you, when the part comes up, the SOC, the ROM is going to run. Uh, and then sometimes there's going to be, um, there's going to be a secondary program loader that gets loaded, which is, and then then U boot and usually those two images both come out of the U boot source tree and then finally uh, U boot loads the kernel and it's also going to load a DTS file and uh, and to kind of kind of highlight again the the elements we need to uh, for the board to boot is um, we have a we all have a processor and SOC and we've got all these peripherals that we want to have on our new drive board and for that we're going to have to have a working bootloader and that working bootloader is already taken care of setting up. Uh, some basic system functionality, such as we're expecting the DDR to already be set up and uh, and basically some clocks and maybe a little bit of power um, so that the processor boots a particular performance point that I guess allows it to boot quickly. But again, those things are, those are the responsibilities of, um, of U-Boot. Uh, then we need a, a Linux kernel. Um, one thing here is like a lot of, uh, I'm not sure, say you have, uh, you can build the kernel, but a lot of maybe perhaps SDKs that come with these evaluation boards, they provide a kernel. I would just recommend using that base kernel that comes with the, uh, the SDK that you get with the board or the SOC that you're working with. And then also just use a root file system. Hopefully it's not too big uh, or they've got varying sizes. Um, and then, the, then back to what I'm talking about, that board DTB, this is your custom board DTB that you've done. So with these with these elements is, is what we're trying to just do a minimal boot on the board. So the um, um, so what's the 
the board state. Okay, so once the bootloader says, I guess I'm getting a little more details about the, the boot state or the, of the uh, what the bootloader has left the processor in is Linux is going to come up and boot. And we're, like I said, we're expecting a bootloader. The U-boot has been ported to the board and run and set up a minimal configuration. And as I was mentioning before, the DDR has been configured in a, in a performance point. And so the bootloader then loads the kernel image and board DTB to the DDR. Um, and typically, I mean, well, I shouldn't say typically, this, the kernel can come from whatever persistent storage you're, you're doing. Um, a lot of the, like the Beagle Bones probably use, they all use uh, having a micro SD card that you can use, or you can use the onboard uh, EMMC, or, well, again, I'm talking, sorry, that's the board itself. Your new design may be something else. But uh, as a, I would add, it'd be nice if you had a, at least an SD card um, for your some of your initial work, because that might help with uh, some initial bring up. Because um, if you're doing like network boot right off the bat, um, I've found that that can be kind of challenging because one of the biggest issues when you're putting a network boot in is, is making sure you get that PHY to MAC um, uh, relationship working. And, and when you get to the higher speed FIs, this usually becomes sometimes problematic because layout comes into play, strapping of the PHY comes into play. Um, and those, uh, those have usually, we've had some headaches with that. So that's why I recommend maybe an SDK, uh, excuse me, an SD card, or maybe some kind of persistent storage. I haven't really tried USB that way, but um, that's why I tend to, I think most designs tend to use SD card uh, for their initial bring up. And so when you're, uh, so is what, what U-Boot does, it's gonna put the, the kernel in the memory along with the new custom DTB uh, file for your new drive board. And, um, as a kernel boots, it's going to consume that DTB file. So it, it gets, it'll override it, but it'll have pulled it into the kernel into this uh, tree that you can then look through the proc. Uh, uh, you can look through using cat proc. You can look at the device tree to make sure your certain elements ended up in the right place. So uh, for an official definition, uh, in this case, we'll use the DTS binds Linux to the, to the board. And this is the this definition here comes from um, uh, from from Wikipedia, and um, the big I want to highlight is that sometimes there's been some confusion that people think that that the DTB code itself, which is the compiled version of DTS, uh, is actually executed. It's not. It's just it's just a big block of metadata that describes components on the board and the processor and the, and the whole system itself. Um, it is not executable. Um, I, at least to my knowledge, it's not. Uh, it's just, again, metadata. And what that device tree is doing, just to kind of, I guess, belabor the point a little bit, is it's going around and looking like all the blocks here for like the USB host, the EMMC, the U micro SD card, not the JTAG. But there's going to be, in this particular instance, there's going to be uh, a processor DTSI file. And then there's going to be in a specific node in the DTS file saying, okay, I'm actually going to use this Ethernet interface, or I'm actually going to use this uh, HD or this, this HDMI port, or I'm going to use this micro SD. So the um, inside the DTS file, and again, we'll this, it's defining all the nodes, but not all of them are enabled. So the DTS file's job is to enable each of these interfaces, and we'll highlight that again here in just a, a bit. So for to uh, drive uh, a new board. Um, based on the existing board is that, uh, again, we're gonna start off and um, and this is, for this example here, I'm kind of showing you how a, a, a reference board looks. As you'll see this processor DTSI file, which again defines the processor and all the peripherals are inside the processor and need to be bound to the peripherals on the board. Um, and you'll see sometimes, a lot of times when people are making common designs, they'll start adding these additional DTS file, DTSI files or include files that, um, allow them to kind of make their design more efficient. Um, and I, I, using TI's cases that we had, um, uh, the, even the BeagleBone Black, but also a different processor, the 5.7 class, um, there would be varying levels of these include files to kind of consolidate um, how to, so that makes the development work that much e uh, easier for the, I guess, the vendor, but maybe a little bit more complicated for you as the, as the developer. and. I'll point it out is that this is again, when you see this, this is typically the SOC vendor trying to make 
their process a little bit more efficient. But you as a developer, sometimes this becomes a little bit more complicated because your design may not follow the design that uh, you're referencing on the SOC platform. So be aware that you may be consolidating yourself. And again, that's why I'm also coming back to, while I'm going to keep harping about the hello world uh, design I'm going to talk about is that with you, with your specific drive board, is that you don't probably need these these different include files. Is it that's really best to start with a minimal one and then add in the peripherals as you see uh, as you for your board. Um, but anyway, so this is the uh, the DTS file, DT, uh, DTS file, and there's a, um, a couple things to point out. So there could be there could be several of these include files where you're including all these different DTS files or even other DTS files, by the way. And then you'll have to start off with a root node. And this is what the, the root symbol here is. And you'll start with a model. And this is where you would put in your new name saying board based design. We'll just call it X1. And then there'll be some more <clears throat> root level nodes that you might have in. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the uh, nodes beyond that. But that's kind of the uh, real basic structure. The, what I'm trying to highlight here is that there's going to be a processor DTSI file that's the most important one you need to include. And then you'll be having to, <clears throat> to rearrange these ones uh, to, uh, to maybe make yours a little bit more simpler. All right, <clears throat> so to highlight again, uh, now to go more specifically how the processor DTSI file typically works. And again, I'll state this and I'll state it several times. This is a file that you as a developer or board developer should not, not be touching. Uh, this is the this is the people, uh, the maintainers of the SOC. This is their main vehicle for describing the processor. Anything you need to do to modify the data that's in that include file, you can do inside the DTS file, and I'll point that out. The reason why I say that is that I've seen a lot of users make modifications here because it was just simpler. But then as their project took, you know, maybe two years to come to, to, to be to completion and they needed to pick up different kernels that this file usually uh, if you've modified this file, you, you're not only having to deal with the changes that got modified, but actually taking your changes back out and trying to merge them. So it becomes kind of a, 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 an upgrade nightmare. So again, don't touch this file. You can always change anything in the file. There's nothing you can't change outside the file. And, and to kind of highlight what the processor DTSI file is, is it, it's gone through, there's a node or an entry in this file that describes everything that you see in a block diagram for the SOC. So all these different peripherals are going to have equivalent um, equivalent representation in that DTS file or nodes as they like to call it. Uh, so any, any proof you want to think of it. So um, it's going to be defined there. And when you uh, typically you, you will get what they call full processor entitlement when all these nodes are defined within this DTSI file. Um, I can't speak for other vendors, but for example, TI list, we, we, we try to, we do get everything defined in there. And then um, that way it becomes, once you have, it's kind of like the definition of the processor. So now you have the definition of processor, you can actually decide which peripherals you're going to actually enable on your particular board. And so, um, so now I want to talk about some of the, how the DTSI file is represented in the file, because this is kind of important, because what I'm trying to, to get across here is that, um, is a lot of times when people are starting out with uh, trying to do a, a board port with DTS file, they're thinking, where do I need to, how much work do I need to do? And, um, and so you're thinking, okay, I'm leveraging a lot of the board. I mean, is it, you know, is there anything additional in, that I need to do? And, and so what I'm going to try and explain is how the, 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 file is kind of put together and how you as the board developer uh, would need to, which, where you need to pay attention. So the first thing within the, the DTS file is there's going to be a definition of the processor that's being used in the SOC. And then the next one is that, um, so let me, wait, let me go back one second here. So this, again, this, most vendors, right, are, are licensing this, 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 uh, this ARM core or whatever processor core they're using. So this is something they're going to be getting from, uh, they're typically licensing. And then here, the SOC vendor, this is where they're adding in their differentiation. They're adding in all these different modules of, of the type of uh, SOC they're trying to put together. And so, um, as I was mentioning before, so each of these modules will then have a, a representation in that DTSI file. And these ones will be specific to the, uh, to the processor. And also there'll be things like, for example, the interconnects and the clocking, all, all the uh, information that interrupts and 
Uh, these are all things that you can abstract out as a board uh, as a board developer. This, these things are all going to be taken care of for you. These, um, the only thing you're going to be having to do is when you get to the next stage is this one here of saying, okay, I want to have a Ethernet. So you're basically saying, I'm going to, I'm going to add in the last little couple of steps or things I need to define that binds that processor to the board. And, um, and so for each of the, like, as you can see, there's several peripherals within this block diagram. We're not, this particular board design isn't going to use all of them. So we're not going to be using complete, I mean, while the processor DTSI defines everything, there's only these peripherals that we're trying to use that uh, need to be defined in the DTS file. And we'll, we'll go into a little bit more how that works. But I want to highlight again here that there's, there's three things here that there's the processor architecture, there's the SOC portion, and then the board binding. This is the part here that um, you as the board developer would be, need to be concentrating on. There's not going to be, uh, I mean, again, you're just doing this last little step. So this is where I was mentioning before is that you're not doing a complete board design. Everything's derivative here. And the derivative bit that you're doing is going to be just that last bit of saying, okay, I'm using this particular interface and I just need to enable it. And like this UART, I'm using which UART you're using. And maybe say there's, say there's six of them, you're only going to use one. Um, there's multiple I squared C, you're only going to use one of the buses. And, um, and so you're, you as the board developer are only having to turn on these particular interfaces in the DTS file. So to kind of highlight that process is where, as you, the board developer has to be, you know, have to be concerned is that just taking any IP, for example, there's going to be internal things that are necessary. Like, where am I getting my clocks? Um, there's a bunch of other interrupts uh, that we need to set up. And, and so there's going to be a lot of stuff that are very specific to the processor. The, this is what's going on. This red box here is being kind of represented uh, by what the processor DTSI file is. It's only when you're having to actually put it on a board, this blue box is representing the bit of information that you as the board developer have to provide. And, but to take into account when it comes time to execute this on a board, these both have to be defined. You have to have both, both of these, every signal has to be accounted for. It's going to make that particular interface work for that in this particular mode that you want. And, um, and as you as a board port developer or a board developer, um, do you have to identify all these settings? No, not, that's kind of what my point here is that a lot of this stuff is already taken care of for you. A lot of, uh, basic overhead is done inside the DTSI file. Sometimes, like you know, point out. I know I've mentioned that you'll have to, you can always rewrite stuff that's in the DTSI file, but there's there's going to be certain things that you'll see as you're defining the board. There's only those couple of things that you need to worry about. And kind of to come back to that. Um, um, that approach I'm talking about. So in terms of components of a DTS file, you've got, um, as, as, you, as you're defining your derivative DTS file, you're gonna have that processor DTSI file, which is this one here, this AM33XX in this particular case. You'll, whatever derivative board you'll, you'll uh, find is that, I wish I had a better way of telling you other than the fact that just looking inside the, the DTSI file, that, and you have to look through several of them sometimes, depending upon the SOC vendor, You'll see a thing when they start defining the processor and, and basic things like that's going to be the processor DTSI and a lot of the different nodes. Um, but I want to highlight again, this is the, the, from a DTS perspective, there's going to be arch specific things, but the, there's nothing really here. It's mostly contained here in the SOC side of the um, thing. So again, there's the SOC component, which is what the SOC vendor provides. And so this is inside the DTSI file. In this case, there's several other include files. But these are things you don't, uh, again, typically have to worry about. You're mostly worried about what do I have to do to enable it with my DTS file? In this particular example, there's actually a third one now that's down here. But um, but as you write your DTS file, then there's, I was mentioning, sometimes there's a, an include file that's used to kind of consolidate designs. And the reason why that's here is that there's a couple of different beagle bones. There's a beagle bone white and a beagle bone uh, black. But there's also, those two are kind of related in design. I know there's several other different colors like green and blue, but um, they're based on uh, just the using this as their processor DTSI file. And they may use, I haven't gone through all of them, they might use some of the things from this bone common DTSI file. But in the end, um, when you when you have a complete DTS file, you've got your arch, 
architecture SFC and your board to find and every signal accounted for that you need on each on each interface. All right, so let's um, talk about uh, the uh, Hello World DTS file. So um, I think I already, I think I already kind of this, this slide looks like it's it looks like maybe kind of redundant. Um, Get a board DTS file is going to, as I was mentioning, is going to have, you're going to find the nodes that you need for the, your SOC application that you're trying to do. Um, and again, it's just a data structure as you put together a DTS file. So this is the uh, hello world concept that I've been talking about. So like I've mentioned before, uh, before is that we have the main, uh, we've, we all recognize this from, from first C, C program, is you have your hello world and you simply do a printf, say hello world. So it's that really simple, simple approach. Uh, a lot of times when a lot of people are doing a lot of simple embedded stuff, they, if the sooner you can blink an LED, sometimes that really, you know, says volumes. I know it's very simple, but people really like that first stage. Okay. Can I get it to work? Can I get it to do something? Can it, can I get it to boot? And that's what the um, hello world's trying to do here. So in this particular case, uh, for the, um, for our hello world, we only need uh, memory, um, a micro SD card and a header, for the UART, um, I put power in there in case I needed it. But in this particular case, I didn't. I didn't need it. Um, but with these three things, I can boot the kernel to a point where I can actually start adding more components or more peripherals to it. And um, and so, with the basic structures, I want to take the uh, the processor DTSI file, and then I'll just and I'm going to make I'm going to call it my hello world. Uh, this is my model that goes into the device tree. I'm going to call it my hello world uh, model. And then I'll add the nodes in as, again, this is, this is extremely simplistic. I'm just trying to show you that there's just a few components that we're using here to kind of, kind of get to that prompt that we uh, really want that basic starting point. And, um, and so if, as you would, once you got to this point, then you would just keep adding these nodes. Like, okay, if you want to add a second MMC or a second UART or ethernet, you would add an EMAC. These are, you would just keep adding these, uh, these nodes to kind of iteratively bring up your board. But this is where we're just trying to do. We're just trying to get to that in this particular example, just trying to get to that prompt. And so we're going back to the block diagram here. What, so I'm only going to be uh, binding three peripherals to the board, a UART, uh, an SD card, and, and the DDR. And the DDR, we already expect because U-Boot's already programmed it, but we are passing some parameters about the memory in the DTS file. And so how are we going to, this is a, now I'm going to talk about how you would construct this DTS file. So I'm going to take this existing reference design and I've kind of, again, kind of genericized it. So I've got um, a processor DTSI file. Again, that's that, that key processor definition. Then there may be in the, the reference design I've got has, has several include files that, um, uh, that don't really match this new design that I'm going to be working on. But uh, to kind of, uh, so I have to go through some of these and figure out which ones I need. But again, I'm just trying to get to a minimal one. So most of the stuff will be about cutting these out. And then um, I should have left this as original processor design. But you see, like, there's a lot of these nodes that are already defined. So we're going to take this existing reference, the board DTS, and we're going to cut it down to a, to a simpler Hello World DTS. And... Um, and, and so we're just going to be in this particular example, we're just going to have just two peripherals enabled, the UART and the MMC. And, um, and we said so we're going to leverage the DTS file to get there. So we're not writing the, the DTS from scratch. I guess you could if you wanted to, but it's a lot easier just to uh, kind of reduce what's there. Um, let's go next. So before we uh, start, uh, modifying experiment, experimenting with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the existing reference design. Uh, I want to kind of cover real quick on how you build the DTB file. So, um, in this, uh, typically, I mean, when you have the, the kernel make system, it's going to have a make target for DTBs. And, um, so in this particular case, I've already added, and I'll show you how I added this. But we want to build the DTBs, and it's going to. And we've added our DTB file in this case. We call the Hello World, and you'll see some maybe some other uh, 
call of uh, compiler tool calls is just building the DTC file or the DTB file. And um, so that's how you build it. And this is a really important debug tip um, is how do you uncompile or disassemble a DTS file? Um, and the reason I want to highlight this is that uh, I've talked with some fellow developers and they, they kind of uh, agree this is that sometimes when you're adding stuff into um, these these really complex, um, I guess, DTS files, where I was telling what I mean by complex, there's like several of these include files that they, they overlap. And sometimes it's kind of hard to keep track of where certain nodes got appended. And so why I'm bringing this up here is that if you ever get stuck, it's always... This is how you would uh, disassemble. Uh, you would call it the DTC compiler from the from the kernel, in the directory that you're running the kernel, and then this dash O is saying I want to output the DTS, and then your little dash little O is being saying this is the name of my DTS file, and it will take this DTB file and it will disassemble it. And so why why that's helpful is that you can then see again it'll be a very long file, but you can then go through and you can account for all your nodes. And if you have any kind of a nesting issue sometimes, uh, or you overwrote something, and to kind of give a real simple example, what I mean by overwrite is that, um, say you set the status to okay, but then you decided you didn't want it, or that's maybe not a good example. Maybe another one would be is you, you set like a file address wrong, and you and you enter the node again, and, and it get uh, set the, the file address again. Now it's incorrect, or you set it correctly, and then you ins un then you un then you set it incorrectly. So what happens is, is when the DTC compiler is going through or uh, compiling your DTS, it's going to take the last thing it finds, and that's what's going to end up in the um, in your DTB file. So what that means, if you've mul done multiple uh, um, like definitions, and I'll show you what I mean by that here in a second. When we talk about no dependent, no depending. Um, you'll see that sometimes it, you know you could you could do several, um, and it's going to take the last one. And that, that's where usually get, you can run into problems. So when you're adding your file to your, uh, your, your can, uh, so it can, you can build it with that DTBS command on the kernel when you're making the, using the kernel tool chain, is that uh, you would go into the make file. And when I highlight where the make file is, it's in the arch arm boot DTS directory. And you would add your file down here. I just put it at the end. You could put it in here anywhere you wanted. But the key thing is, you, if it's going to be, um, if you don't, uh, you, when, you, when you're building, you're building for a particular processor, right? So in this case, we're building AM33XX. So whatever process you're building, your DTB has to be in that same uh, config area where all the other DTBs are for that particular SOC. And um, so, the highlight, so if you are building your board and you don't push it mainline, this is a change you'll have to do every time there's a kernel upgrade. So. Uh, just be aware of that, but um, I think a lot of people are, there's, I'm sure there's way more boards than what's on mainline, but um, but that's where, that's where you put it. Uh, so where's the DTB file stored? So in this particular example, as I was telling you, this is where we're using an SD card for the uh, root file system. So U-Boot will read, um, will load the uh, kernel with the DTB file. So in this particular case, you see this is the this is a this is we're looking at the boot directory on the SD card that I was using, and um, the uh, you'll see that there's several DTB files, and um, and the reason there's several DTB files for one reason is that on boards that are using TI processors, and this is I think true for some other vendors, there's a there's a an EEPROM that goes on the board. That allows you to have a single kernel binary, and then you can you, you can select based on a value that's in the EEPROM, the uh, DTB file that goes with that board, and um, so the, that's that's where you would put your DTB file and your bootloader. Again, this is going to be an exercise of the bootloader. The bootloader is the one that has to read both the kernel and the DTB file and put it in memory, and then pass that to the kernel as it boots. Um, but I, in this particular example, I was I'm just going to show you a little trick that I was doing because I was being I didn't want to have to go change my U-boot settings. I knew that this I was doing a lot of this, this development for this presentation on the Beagle Bone Black, so I want to highlight what I did was is I have I copied in my I don't know if you can see it because I, I can't highlight but there's a hello world here down towards the bottom you can see that's the file that's 30 31k roughly, and then you can look up higher in the list, and you can see the the actual Beagle Bone Black. 
uh, DTB file and it's got the same date. So what I was doing here was, is I was trying to give myself the option of being a, of being a little bit lazy. So I can, I can leverage the U-boot without having to make any changes while I'm testing my DTB file. So this is how you might want to do this with your, uh, if you're doing this on a, and you have a similar setup, um, whether you EEPROM or not, this is how I develop, I would recommend developing your whole world is on your existing reference design. You can, you can cut your file down to this, this base minimum uh, using that board and, and then using the U-boot that goes with it. Okay, so now we're going to talk some of the techniques I use to kind of kind of consolidate into a single hello world file. So going into this is the uh, this is the top level DTS file thing for for Beagle Bone Black, and there's two 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 include files, and this is where this there's a Bone Black common, and there's a Bone common, and um, a lot of this information there. Since I'm only wanting to bring up those uh, the the I only want to bring up the root file system, which on an SD card, and only time I want to have a, con uh, a console with UART. So a lot of these things that are in here are, are going to be redundant. I mean, well, not redundant. They're not, they're superfluous. I, mean, I don't need them right now. So I could, um, but I don't know if there's some other information in there. So what I'm going to show you this is that sometimes there might be some other information in there that's kind of critical to the boot that you don't know about. So you have to kind of go through these because you don't really know. I mean, you could go through the code, but to me, it was just faster to kind of go through the code and start commenting out. Uh, certain uh, certain areas and seeing how that would if it would if it would boot after that. So like in this particular uh, example here, <clears throat> so I would um, I've already started in the DTS file. I so said I didn't think I wanted anything to do with the OPP table because that's kind of a higher level. Once I'm into the kernel, uh, again this is a little bit of experience on my part I admit, but you can pick any node and just put this if zero around it or do the regular C comments and just comment out that node and see if it uh, even compiles. And then we'll, after it compiles, then you want to see if it runs. And so I would iteratively do this for all the elements that were in these two, these two include files. And so for me, again, I'm kind of familiar with it. It took maybe a little bit less than about, uh, about 40. No, I didn't take that long. It took 30 to 40 minutes, and I'm being, I'm being a little bit generous on the time. It probably doesn't, may not take that long. Uh, it just depends on how fast you want to comment out things and then re rebuild it and get it loaded. And this is more examples of um, kind of showing elements that I don't really care about at the moment. So I would just comment them out um, and then uh, and then see if it would boot. This one, though, was kind of critical since this was the MMC and I need to define power for my uh, MMC card. And um, so the one question you might have right now I kind of answer is, how do you know you need MMC? So we'll talk about uh, device tree binding files. There's going to be required elements. and uh, so there's two ways. You can read through every binding document and see what's required, or you can just kind of, you know, experiment with uh, with a DTS file and just start cutting things out until it quits working. Um, that's kind of what I did here. I've, I've heard of people talking about that. Just, uh, just kind of, well, I'll tell you. Anyway, um, so to keep going here is that, uh, you see this next uh, note down here, I I didn't highlight, but there's an if zero. So like this MMC2, which is I'm not even going to use that node. So I just commented it out. So I just needed one MMC internet, uh, interface for my root file system. And uh, and I need to make sure it had power to it. Again, I want to highlight the process as iterative. There'll be a few times that when you when you cut something out, so like say, for example, if you were to cut out this MMC interface, you would find that, okay, it would hang when it was trying to mount the uh, root file system. That would be the that's the that's what would happen here if you didn't have in this uh, this um, this uh, this power supply definition. So how does that um, kind of look when I when I got done? So as you can see here now, I've only got the include. You know, I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail. So I don't think you have to. Um, I'm going to go through each step, but I'm going to kind of step through the um, highlights here. Is it so? Now you saw we had like three include files before. Now we're just down to the one, which is the process, processor include file, and then we're just defining the memory we have on the board. This chosen is an important thing for um, this. Is the you have to tell the kernel which one's going to be your standard out, and we're going to say the UART zero is that. And then uh, we have the voltage regular that I was mentioning before. This is critical, so otherwise you can't mount the uh, the SD card. It won't actually it won't enable, so you couldn't so you could mount it. And then there's um, some vendors have uh, requirements. Ti is one about having pin mux. so we have variable pin mux that allow you to uh, select 
based on how you want to lay out your board, perhaps, um, it gives you advantage of being able to select different pins for different uh, different peripherals. And so on this particular part, we have to make sure that we've got uh, the pin mux lined up. Otherwise, the IP won't be connected to the pin. And then continue on. This is the additional more pin mux for the um, for the uh, MC inter for the MMC interface, which is SD card. And then this is the uh, uh, the the UART nodes. This is where we're just we're going to turn on UART zero and MMC one. Now, I want to highlight back in that diagram where I had the blue and the red boxes is that there's a whole lot more signals that are required. Excuse, well, signals or definitions that are required for your UART to work. But you, as a board developer, only have to do these two or three signal and three lines here. And so what we're telling it is that we have to tell which uh, uh, pin control we're using and which set of pins we're using. And then finally, the status, okay. This is the main thing for any DTS, right? If, until um, you set the device to our status to okay, that, that peripheral is not going to work. So in the DTSI file that's defined for the processor, every node, every, excuse me, every peripheral node is always going to be set to disabled. And as, as you're bringing your board up, this you just need to turn on the ones you're using. And then the, down here for the MMC is that um, this is all you need, even though there's, there's several more required uh, uh, fields that need to be filled out for the node, these are the only ones you need to do to bind it to the board. So you're just looking for a status. And this, in this particular case, since we're using a micro card, we're using four, um, four pins. And I'm kind of uh, getting I'll go into a little bit more detail here in a second, I think, because I think I broke this down by interface. So kind of, again, step through this in an order of how you can look at the file. So first thing in your file, this is true for every DTS file, as you're saying, which version of DTS you're using. And then um, this is the key part. Want to make sure you have your Arch SOC abstraction file. This is where your processor include file goes. And... Um, and, for, and without this right, you, just, you don't have a board. And then uh, this is when we're breaking down. So now we're defining the root node. And as I've mentioned before, we have, we've defined our model, our, a, uh, our, our hello world board, and then the compatible field. These are really important, um, especially we'll talk more down here at the, uh, in, in the, uh, in the device nodes here. Um, and then the, how much memory we're using, again, the UART. So let's talk about, uh, some of the fields here. So like the compatible field here uh, is really critical and that uh, whatever node you're putting in here, or this is also true for load nodes, but this in this particular case, we're saying this is a regulator fixed. Um, again, I'm leveraging the existing board design here. I didn't have to figure this out. Um, since there is a, you can, a lot of times you can do that, but here, say when we're talking about power, for example, you have to be, you know, leverage what's there, but also be aware of what you're doing. Um, so for example, in this particular case, we're saying that the card only is going to have 3.3 uh, volts for a, for a min and a max. If you had different cards with different speeds, these things would probably change. But again, you can leverage a lot of existing designs um, like SOC vendors. Again, when you're, when you're looking at how they define the nodes, again, you want to leverage that. Uh, it's good to be looking at the device tree bindings file, which we'll get to in a second. But again, leverage I just want to highlight leverage what's there. And that's all I did in this particular case is I just took this definition that was already there for the Beagle Bone Black. Because my new design or my new this new board I'm trying to do would be exactly like that for the most part. And uh, so let me talk a little bit more about pin mux so you can uh, appreciate what I'm going to show you next and the why why the pins are defined that way. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the SOCs have um, um, you know, have, have some of them have the ability to you know route different signals to the pins based on how they want to lay out things on the board. Um, in this particular example, this is coming out of the data sheet. Is it? I know I'm saying I'm trying to set up a, a CAN bus, and this particular pin, this J, I forget it was J18. I want to make sure that it's lined in with my uh, with my DCAN IP that's inside the SOC. And so with these different modes, um, mode one is what turns on the uh, CAN bus to this pin. If I <clears throat> made a mistake and say I left it as zero, then I'd be talking to my, um, <clears throat> I guess an MII port would be uh, TX data line three would be coming out to this pin 
which is not going to be a CAN bus. So when you're bringing up a board and you have to worry about pin mucks, make sure this is a this is also a big um, big problem because this is where a lot of derivative designs would be changing. Is that you might be using the peripherals just a little bit different. So you want to make sure you're just not cutting pasting directly from that DTS derivative file. Or reference file into your new file if you've made any kind of changes like this. So be aware of be aware of pin mucks. Okay. Um, so going into this this bit here again kind of talking about more about more pin mucks. So the so coming from this particular image now we have to enter this into a DTS file. Um, a lot of uh, I guess I, I don't know about other vendors, but there is a there is a tool that you can use to kind of help with this. Is that you would enter the um, the pins that you're trying to use for a particular interface to be a PinMux tool. Uh, I, think, I think it's we call it something called System Config Tool now. Um, but hopefully there's a tool like that, so you as a developer are not having to go through and figure out all these lines because these are um, this can be if you if you get a direction wrong or a mux mode wrong, like I was telling you, or a pull up or pull down wrong, that can impact your your um, your your setup so hopefully if there's a tool there make sure you leverage the tool to kind of output this information that you can include as a, either include file for your new board or that you can just cut and paste directly and drop into your dts file but um so devices that have uh, pinmux uh, requirements be be aware of that and hopefully rely on whatever tools they provide uh, for you um so moving on to the nodes themselves I want to highlight is that, um, like I was saying before, is that uh, there's just a there's just a few lines you need to do to add the board and make it active, and <clears throat> this ampersand here at the beginning is critical to uh, making sure you're this is what you call it, you're appending to a node. So um, we'll go in a little bit more detail about the UART, but UART zero, there's already one defined in the DTSI file. So you want to say, okay, I just want to tell, I want to actually turn it on. But I need to also tell it which pins it's going to be using for its interface. And so you're passing these things and uh, so that when the driver's coming up, it will then reference this particular uh, um, entry in the node. So um, when we get to the, uh, and I get to the full-blown disassembled version, I'll show you just how the, the node's kind of processed. Um, but as we're, saying, we're sort of showing the UART0 and MMC1. Again, these are specific names that we're trying to bring up. So as you saw, uh, kind of going through this, we're again turning on the interface with the status OK. Um, we're saying we're going to use a 4-bit bus width here. And then we're saying which pins I want you to use for this interface. And then when there's a card detect pin, we need to add in in the direction or the activeness if it's low or high. And then I also have to give um, uh, this uh, basically the power supply that's going to be used for the MFC interface. Again, highlighting, it's like, for example, if you uh, just to kind of give you an example, if you if you don't define this is a required property. If you don't know, again, I'll explain what required properties are in a second. If that's not there, then you'll see it's like the board. I mean, the board will hang as it tries to mount its root file system. But you'd see a whole bunch of other things uh, because the UART's working. So that's kind of a one of those nice things about it. Sometimes with again with this minimal whole world, you can debug it and is with left with just a UART. Um, and I want to highlight again that um, do not make these changes in the processor DTSI file. You could, but don't because of for upgrade reasons. And um, at, least, at least that's my personal opinion. I think I think people, you know, you, you want to do it, that's probably fine. But if you want to upgrade later, you'll, uh, you're going to be, it's going to be a little bit of a headache. Um, so what, um, okay, it looks like this slide got repeated. Oh, okay. This is, I'm, I'm sorry. All right. So the, uh, this is, the, again, this is the bit that we put in our whole world file here, this UART zero. This is all we needed to do to turn on the device. But when it gets compiled and gets processed and read by the serial driver, this is what the serial driver is going to see. It's going to see this data structure with all this, this information in it. But use the board port developer only necessary to fill out this bit. The rest of this information came from the DTSI file. And, um, so we'll step through a couple of nodes. So as the driver's coming up, it's going to look at this compatible field to make sure the driver's aligned with this particular node. Uh, and some of this stuff is going to be very specific to the driver as you, as a, as a board, board developer, don't really need to know about, because uh, this is like internal driver information, like this TI hardware mods, 
this clock frequency. Uh, there's a couple of registers. This is the register start. Uh, the interrupts that we're using, for, for like you don't have to know which interrupt you have to worry about for the uh, for the uh, for the UART. You can if you want to, but um, this is just to help you try to come up to speed quickly on your design. Um, as as you as you divide, as you mature, working on more and more DTS files, some of this information may become more important to you. Um, the DMA channels that are going to be used, the DMA names, uh, and then finally this is the pin control name. So if we look at just kind of highlight the stuff that you as a board developer had to define. These are the only two things that are showing up in that particular um, for this particular node. Now let me point out something else here. So if you were to look through the DTS file. I didn't point out something here when I was reviewing the slides is that see how this is UART zero and then you'll see this is serial at this particular base address. Um, why I'm highlighting this is that this is an alias and in the DTSI file it's alias, aliasing um, UART zero to this interface. So just so you're aware of how that works. So this is the UART binding doc. So this is the this is in, I want to highlight where it's at, so I'll just go to the next slide. It's in the kernel directory um, and in the documentation directory, device tree binding serial OMAP, and it's OMAP underscore serial dot text. And, um, um, and you'll see, like we saw before, we saw like compatible fields. And if you looked at, we, let's go back, I guess two slides to kind of highlight here. See this compatible AM3352 UART and TI, and then there's one called OMAP3 UART. And that is, uh, well, it's kind of like shown here, but uh, that's where the OMAP3 UART. So this compatible field really is important. But again, these are, these are things that are taken care of inside the DTSI file. You don't have to worry about this, but if, if you're trying to understand, when you look at a bindings document, it's, you need to look at that unassembled node that I was just showing you because all this information needs to be there. And then what I was also mentioning before, like there's what they call required properties, and then there's optional properties. And um, you can see that some of the nodes that we're using are optional, or excuse me, field field names are optional. And then there's additional optional ones you can use. And these are like, for example, if you're implementing particular like like RS45 or, uh, or additional uh, type of how you're implementing the RS45. But this is a, an important document, and this is and this is not just for the obviously for the UARTs. This is for all the per, uh, peripherals that are defined in the SOC. And you can always um, kind of by looking in your reference board, you can kind of look at the compatible field here. If you want to, if you're not if you're not finding this particular uh, text file, I'd always recommend taking the uh, compatible field here and then doing a grep on this directory. Um, oh, hold on just a second. Uh, apologies for that. Um, all right, uh, next. So, how do we know our "Hello World" file worked? So, here's a copy of the out, of the console output, and um, and I want to highlight first is let's see if I did this. No, I didn't highlight it. Okay, all right, I guess I did. So, this is the start of our um, our, uh, our 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 kernel output. So, the first thing you want to look at, or obviously, this is your the kernel that you've got built. And what you're looking for is that your your hello world, your machine model name works. So what I mean by that, that's our new DTS file. So if you want to make sure that you're actually using your DTS file that you created. So look at the model name there. And uh, that, that gives you a good indication. Okay, I'm using the DTB file or DTS file that uh, I created for my board. And then um, I want to see if uh, the information I've got for the, uh, for the MMC is working correctly. And so I'm copying out. You'll see certain information, like, like for example, got the CD uh, GPIO, which is coming out of uh, our field here. So these are you can look through the DTS file and make sure you can kind of see some of these clues. The biggest one is is that when you say the status OK, then you should start seeing this interface come up, like the the uh, MMC interface. And then obviously it finds the card, and then it uh, it's going to mount the card. Okay, uh, and then finally it got to our uh, our all important prompt. This is what we want to see. This is so we just did those three uh, those three interfaces, getting the um, getting the, the memory in there, and getting the, the UART and the MMC in there, 
and the Pimux for it, and uh, we now have a working processor. And this is this is our success point of knowing, okay, we actually got our Hello World file to work, and now we can start adding in the rest of our nodes to continue our board bring up. But this is, I would say, this is the this is a celebration point here, is that uh, when you get to this, it means you've uh, you've gotten past any potential issues like um, maybe some power issues or, or maybe some board issues. I'm not saying you won't find them after you bring up other interfaces, but this is this is a really huge step. And, uh, and it gives you, a again, a baseline that you can start working with, continuing to bring the rest of the board up. All right, so let me uh, talk about um, the uh, FD, SD, uh, well, I'll call it the SDK lifecycle, but it's actually the, the kernel lifecycle. And this is something I've picked up over a few years. And what we've seen with people who are working on boards is that um, they'll start a process, they'll start a board design, and they'll be real energetic, but then something will come up and they'll, the, that design will get pushed off to the side for up to a couple of years, maybe. And um, in that time, right, the kernel is always marching on new features, new, new, new driver fixes, and just all this just continued advancement of the kernel. And so it's with each LTS release, it's kind of like, you know, your, your uh, original design, you're starting to get further and further behind. And um, so what people find is that um, especially with DTS files, is the DTS and the processor DTS I files are always changing. Um, but why I'm highlighting this is that um, is that some customers, I shouldn't say users, um, they will they, they'll come back and they'll say, "Wow, look at these new features I want to take advantage of," or there's a couple of kernel really key kernel bug fixes I really need to pick up, and just dropping that new kernel in probably isn't going to well kernel will is there, but the the uh, DTS file no longer works with that kernel. And then they're back into that same uh, process of having to do almost a complete port. And uh, sometimes it's not too bad. It depends upon the interfaces that they're using. But I've seen a lot of people, you know, get frustrated with having to notice they might have to take a couple of weeks to, to redo the, uh, the upgrade. So my suggestion is with the, um, uh, well, kind of highlight again, the, you're always going to have this upgrade port versus back port. Typically, the, the back port I don't think is a good idea because that just seems like that's a whole lot more work than trying to upgrade your DTS file, no matter how bad the DTS file is. Um, but the the upgrade port is it for some reason that seems to be a, a, a big decision for depending on how complicated it is. But I always recommend um, I think just always the always keep moving and keep up with the kernel. I know that sounds um, some people, this is, they just, you know, it sounds like work they don't want to have to do, but uh, I think it's it's a it's an effort that's really really valuable. Um, so let's uh, go to the next uh, kind of slide is to kind of highlight uh, how things can change. And so this is looking at um, I kind of snapshot of the DTSI file for the 335x and um, and just the processor include file. There was uh, there was just a ton of changes and. Um, I thought I'd put it down here. Uh, there was like significant changes, like a couple hundred lines worth of changes. And so this is where I'm saying, if you've modified this with uh, your, um, with your, when you did your derivative board, uh, then you're going to have to do two things. You're going to have to, you're going to have to modify your DTS file, but you're also got to modify, you're going to have to find out everything you did to the DTS I file that you were trying to do for your board and either pull it in your DTS or put it back in the DTSI. I would again, always recommend putting it into the DTS file. And uh, then moving on would be the next issue is that um, this is where when uh, basically uh, uh, users who've got like a large existing design inventory, they may have four or five, maybe six designs. And um, they're trying to, okay, they're going to add a, the next design X. And they're saying, well, maybe it's this time, um, we need to maybe think about upgrading the kernel um, because sometimes they'll for for years they'll have multiple designs in one kernel that kernel may be getting to like four or five years old and now there's new features and bug fixes they're trying to fix up and now they're having to do this to all their board in their inventory so this can be kind of a a big headache for them uh, for users so um and also there's always the uh, design refresh when uh, certain parts become obsolete or certain parts, new parts come online that they may want to take advantage of them, maybe consolidate designs. Um, but if you, um, if you've had this, if you had your hello world uh, for this design, you could, um, um, it would allow you to, uh, to, you know, maybe just at least test the new kernel, see if it's going to work 
in a, in a very basic manner on your board. And then you could always, again, um, if you want to leverage and upgrade later, you can always do that same iterative approach again. Um, and okay, wait, I want to come back and highlight one more thing about this uh, design inventory here is that um, as you, um, um, oh gosh, the thought escaped me. Okay, maybe I'll come back to it maybe during Q&A. Um, all right, so the Q&A, I guess, session could start now. Um, I have one more thing real quick, and maybe I'll just do this. Real, uh, but uh, um, looks like we have a little bit of time here. I want to get to this point because this is something that has to do with Hello World, but I want to talk about adding in your root file system into your kernel. And this is another uh, tip that we've used quite a bit to help us with board bring up. If you can't get your uh, root file system to, or your SD card to work or something like that, you may have network working or something like that. If you can build your root file system in to the kernel, that would actually save you another entry in your, in your hello world. But it actually gives you that key point I was mentioning earlier about getting to a point where you can um, actually add in um, the support you need for uh, getting the, uh, uh, like particularly helping you debug interfaces. So um, in this particular case, kind of step through it is that, uh, yeah, um, step through it is that you can just go into the kernel config and uh, you're going to add in, uh, you're going to go into general setup and uh, um, and you're going to go from there. But I want you to highlight, you're, you're going to have to have a root file system. Uh, some people, I guess you could uh, maybe use BusyBox here. Uh, that's I've only used that. We have a, a TI as a file system. We have what we call a minimal file system that allows us to do that. But if you can find access to a file system for the particular SOC that you're working on, uh, you want to make sure that the utilities you need are in that uh, in that uh, file system. And then you would uh, add it into this line here, which looks a little small. And, uh, and then you would just rebuild the kernel. And then once that's done, you would have, um, and this is just an example of me putting in a root file system here. So the big thing to point out is that your kernel will probably go from more four megabytes to about 20 megabytes. And, uh, and that will greatly increase the uh, amount of, um, uh, I guess, time it takes to download. So if you're expecting like maybe a couple of seconds, this might turn into a 30 second download uh, or, or more. It depends on the interface that you're using to read the kernel in. So um, with that, uh, I guess uh, open up the Q&A section. Oh, um, I guess the, uh, I guess I got a lot of questions here about asking about whether or not, uh, um, I guess I didn't see these as going along. Um, so I guess going through these, uh, I assume these uh, slides would be shared. Um, I don't know, Bahan, do you, do you know? It will be or shared. Okay. Yes, yeah, so they will be shared. Uh, in fact, we'll, um, uh, they'll be on Sketch. They'll also be on the um, uh, on our uh, Embedded Essentials website, and uh, actually also on the eLinux wiki. In fact, I was going to grab a copy of them from you at the end if you haven't already uploaded them to uh, to uh, Sketch. Okay, I haven't uploaded it to them, but I can I can do that, or I can I'll get. They it will be it. they will be indeed. Uh, I'll uh, I'll put a link in the um, uh, in in the questions here uh, as to where they will be. Okay, um, so that's that's quite a few questions. Uh, in terms of, I guess, assuming the presentation is available for download, that would be uh, um, yeah, that seems to be a real common thing. Yep. Uh, what was the reference Generally is. previous uh, for uh, Petazoni? Um, I, there's a link in the presentation to the one I was talking about that talks about the free electrons uh, device tree uh, tutorial or background or um, I forget what the exact name they call it, but it's a Again, it's a great presentation. They kind of go through lots of different architectures and showing how the, the device tree goes together for several of these. 
All right, so one question was, why is it hard for peripherals to be discoverable like PCIe devices in x86? Um, the, uh, so again, I'm not a PCIe expert. I believe those are discoverable, but things like uh, the I squared C devices, they're not discoverable because um, I guess there's not really a protocol for it. Uh, you typically, that's why you have to know in advance these devices are there. Same thing with like the SD cards. Now, SD cards is kind of interesting in that you have to tell the kernel that the SD card is there, but then the SD card, excuse me, then the kernel and the driver will go out and determine what's the best mode. So once it knows it's there, there's quite a bit of negotiation that happens uh, with the SD card. Um, it's just, there's, I guess to answer the question in general, like um, a lot, of, it's not, so, it's, I guess that's just the way things were, I guess, written is that you have to know that you're using an Ethernet interface to, to know that, uh, and what's out there in terms of like where the phi is and and um and then but once it once the kernel knows where the phi is again there's negotiation with the phi and the driver for the phi driver that kind of um uh kind of um kind of let you know exactly you know what the modes the phi supports and what to set up the uh, the interface at speeds for um, i hope that answers that question if not please post again i can go into it So the one question is the processor.dts file is just in this example, uh, right? Sometimes the content will be inside the main DTS file. Uh, it could be. Um, the uh, that I, I, I'll answer the question from the perspective is that when the SOC vendors are creating their processor DTSI file, they uh, some of them do they're just making abstraction. They're, there's nothing saying that you have to do that. I think that's just been a convention that's been established for. Um, just having abstraction of defining everything that's in the, the processor and being able to include it and ideal making the DTS file itself a little bit more simpler. Um, but there's, yeah, there's content could be however you want to uh, put it. Hopefully that uh, answers the question. Um, why Sitara packages is great for app development. I'm not quite sure how to answer that one. I was just using that as an example uh, for today's today's talk, I'm sure if you look at the other SOC vendors, they have uh, they have their I mean how they package their um, their SDK or kernel or how they want to relate. I haven't really looked at that to be honest. I was just simply saying is I'm assuming I guess I should have said that when you're when you're doing an SOC derivative board, I'm assuming that you have access to um, to a kernel tree and it may depend upon how the kernel's packaged up. TI packages as an SDK, uh, but there's no, I mean. Uh, you could just, all you really need is a, I guess you could go with a mainline kernel and a tool chain and be able to build for the board also. So um, it's just, I've, I was just kind of referencing what uh, TI has done, but there's nothing, it, when you're following mainline, which is what I guess on the TI processor, a lot of all these SOC vendors are doing, there's nothing, you could always clone uh, the mainline tree and build everything there. Okay, that's the last question I see. Is there, are there any more questions? On the little right arrow, it goes. Uh, there's there's five pages of questions. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I had the Thank same you. problem in my talk. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, don't you think it's easier to get the latest kernel to boot than take similar boards old kernel? Usually, major release and then upgrade. Um, let me think about that for a second. Um, I, I, well, I'm not sure if I'm following. Um, yes, the latest, getting the latest kernel to boot is, is always, I, I would always agree with that. Um, taking the similar board, the old kernel and using, um, yeah, I, okay. I actually, okay. I think what you see, I, I think I understand what you're asking. Um, so this is how you want to upgrade. Um, sure. I guess it's, um, the thing I was talking about what I've, I've usually done, but, um, you, you could, I don't see why you couldn't do that. What is the full form of RBL? Uh, if uh, ROM bootloader is what I think you're asking. Um, it's this, uh, I, I'm using that term because I've seen it used a few times. I'm not sure if that made, maybe there's a different term to use, but that's basically the code that's inside the ROM that's figuring out the next stage of boot. So if you're, once the, when the boot ROM comes up, it's gonna determine 
where am I going next? Is it just going to go to a peripheral to read in an image? So if it's going to like a, a NAND or, um, or SD card or even you know, like network, it's um, basically saying, okay, I'm going to run this particular code inside the ROM. And that's why I was referring to it as a ROM bootloader. Uh, that question, are these going to slides yes, they'll be available for download? Ah, okay. Good question here is, uh, yeah, I, I was trying to be generic. Um, is processor DTSI actually named processor.dtsi or is it a stand-in for the actual processor? Example given, uh, AAM335x.dtsi, I can, can we grab for processor DTSI and when looking at DTS file? Uh, no, I was using that as a, as a generic term. Uh, whenever you're uh, basing your design on derivative board, you'll have to look at existing designs, uh, those existing DTS files, and be able to extract out the, uh, the, uh, the, the processor DTSI file. And again, that's assuming that they follow the, um, this, I'm, I'll call it, for lack of a better term, an abstraction for defining a processor. Um, I think that's becoming pretty common because of how at least, at least our files seem to be changing. So yes, it was it was definitely a just I was using it as a stand-in, so it'd be generic. Um, and then will these slides be available? Yes. Uh, what is Simple Bus? And what is? Gosh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I said that or not. Uh, I don't know how to answer that one. Uh, what is the syntax DTS? Okay, it stands for DTS version one, and it's basically that's the uh, I guess it's telling the, D, the device tree compiler which uh, version of DTS that you're using. What is the PRCM and LCD controller example? That is a power reset controller module. Um, and I was, all I was just trying to highlight that there are uh, interconnects within inside the uh, SFC, for example, that might be controlling a power and reset for a particular module. And that's what uh, PRCM is in this particular, with the, the LCD controller example. Hi, is there a complete example of the DTS source file? Um, I guess what I could do if uh, I could ask Bahan is I can I can upload the one that I did in this presentation that you could uh, compile directly. Um, is that possible, Bahan? Absolutely. Yeah, no, it absolutely is. And just, you know, I'm uh, starting at the end of your list. And uh, just because we're going to run out of time, I'm, I'm trying to answer the questions from behind. You'll notice that I've okay. marked a bunch as ignore where, where, where there's repeats. Okay. So if, if it's grayed okay. out, you can just skip it. Okay. Okay, I looked at the GitHub link, could not locate. Um, I think that's something that we'll have to, all right, let me go to the next page. Okay, do you know what's allowed to be put on a root node versus some other node? Uh, that is a great question. Um, this is where I'll have to tell you, you need to rely on what you find on your base derivative board. It's very important that you get the nesting correct inside the root node. Um, that's a really good question. Um, if uh, I would love to save that for a topic uh, some other time, because that has caused me a lot of grief. If you don't get the um, uh, the nesting right inside the root node, things just don't just don't work. They end up in other parts of the tree, and the driver can't find them. So I guess that is really critical. Okay, so how do you come up with a pin control single pins? Those are things that are defined by the people who defined, uh, with, I guess the maintainers who define the pin control structure for the DTS files. Um, I don't think that's, I think that's anybody, anybody who's using PinMux will have to follow that one. That should be, excuse me, that should be in the um, DTS um, bindings uh, document. You should be able to find more of a definition on that. Okay, does status equals okay being first or last matter? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know, I think what I know what you're saying is that as soon as you define status equals okay, that means that device is active. And um, it doesn't, oh, I so it's, it's structured, no, because this is just something that's, uh, so long as that flag gets set, um, there's not really a dependency, it's my knowledge, inside of any DTS node. They just, that information just has to be there because the driver will parse it based on looking particular fields. So it does not be first or last, it just has to be set to okay. Yes, they can be replaced. Oh, see, I'm sorry, I'm kind of jumping ahead here. So the, uh, yeah, I call the dependent. They can be replaced. It's basically you're saying you're going to update the UART definition. That's probably, I probably didn't use that term correctly. 
So yeah, I agree with that. Is that uh, you can be replaced, and also not only that, you can remove things uh, from that. There's actually a remove flag that you can use inside of a uh, when you're using that ampersand symbol. Uh, somebody else is uh, talking about for DTB reverse compiling is offering another tool, DTX difference. Uh, I vaguely heard of that one. Um, I'd like to look into that more myself. That's a good question. Um, okay, thank you for the comment. Great presentation. Are you aware of uh, that? I'm not sure about. I would. That was one of the things I was hoping to kind of maybe kind of spark is that uh, about lifecycle and operations because I think this is a a, a big uh, issue for people when they they don't update their their car or their DTS files for a couple of years. And uh, it would be really great because I've had numerous complaints about it really just really impacts their development process. They use something they didn't have, they didn't anticipate they would have to do. It's typically where that comes into play. Uh, or were they trying to tell me? Uh, oh, I'm not, okay, I guess what they're saying is that, I'm, I guess I missed that question. I, I should look at this thing. I'll look at this uh, collaborate. I wasn't aware that the, about this with Lenaro, but thanks for that tip. Uh, am I working on um, example tutorial page link? Uh, not at this time, but uh, it probably will because this is a, a, a lot of questions. You see a lot of this is experience-based information and it'd be kind of good to kind of help people not have to uh, uh, help people with, uh, with, their, with their upgrades. Uh, do you ever use device tree overlays with the customers you support? Uh, no, TI does not. But if you look at the community boards, that's a big part of the community boards. And I, I don't really, we don't support the community boards too much, but um, uh, we don't use, uh, but that's one of the great things about, uh, I'll admit the device tree overlays are actually a pretty, uh, pretty important thing. Are there differences between what you boot and the Linux kernel need in the DTS? Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, these days, since the U-boot has moved into the uh, driver model, a lot of the times the uh, DTS files are very similar, uh, but there's no guarantee that they are. Um, that one I'd have to reflect on a little bit more. I'm not sure if I can answer that one, is, other than the fact that they both use DTS files now. And uh, they try to make the functionality the same, I believe. Uh, would I suggest any tutorials for new beginners? Um, well, I was hoping that this one would be a, a good tutorial, but may, uh, but I could, um, again, the thing I would point out is that the uh, free electrons is a good one, but um, uh, the, I'm trying to think of, just remember, it, a lot of the things in the, the, a lot of times you'll see, I can see the other reason for the question is a lot of stuff you find in device tree is written at the device driver writer level and not really the uh, board developer level. Um, I wish, I mean, I don't have an answer for that one, but I think that's a great idea. If I can think of some, I'll try and I'll work with Behan maybe to kind of post it. Uh, could you please talk about the alias a little bit more? Sure. Um, the, um, in, inside the, uh, the, um, inside the DTSI file, there's usually a large list. They used to be sometimes in the DTS to uh, alias. So if like you we're know, seeing like MMC1, that's, that's a whole lot easier to, to look at in a DTS file rather than saying, okay, it's serial at this particular address. So they're trying to make the, um, the whole purpose of the alias is trying to make the DTS file a little more readable and not having to know that serial is, this particular address is like, uh, and the reason why is like, for example, if you saw that serial is like a hex address. You don't know what the order is in terms of, I guess you could look at the, um, if you could look at all of them together. Uh, okay. Uh, all right, it'll be kind of quick here. I've got to get through the messages here. Um, but aliases are just designed to make the DTS file a little bit more readable. Uh, outside of debugging, other use case for RAM is desired. Um, I think that's a, a system design decision. Uh, I like the, uh, the the root file system built in the kernel. Just kind of is it, is nice. But um, but I've seen I've seen use cases where people wanted just to use that. Just got to remember you can't really store it off. Uh, does DTS can it be updated on the fly? Uh, not to my knowledge. It's a boot. It's a one-time boot. As a process, as the kernel reads in the DTB, that's it. It doesn't get. Uh, it can't. You can't be updated. Uh, you could probably edit the, the entries in the field, but I think you have to be careful about it if you're loading drivers. Not again. That's a good question. Uh, it might be. I don't want to tell you no. Uh, just know when the DTB is read in, it, it, then it goes into the DT file. So I guess excuse me, the kernel device tree. You probably could. 
but uh, I don't, I haven't really done that. Um, how to proceed when we are designing DTS from scratch? Removal of unwanted property. Uh, well, the the I, well, I guess the answer to the question about uh, designing from scratch is that this this was about uh, leveraging. Uh, if you're doing a unless you're doing an SOC bring up, then that, then you're doing it from scratch. I would say you're always doing a derivative work based on any. Um, SOC that already exists. If you're bringing up a new SOC, then yes, you're going to have to develop from, from uh, scratch. And uh, that's the only time I would see it wouldn't work. Uh, what probing hardware do you recommend? Um, that's a really uh, involved question. Um, I typically, I said, once I get the, uh, it just depends on the order you need things in, I would guess. Uh, I would say once you get to that base prompt with a console, then you can start, you can pick whatever devices or you want to bring up next. Uh, I don't know about the videos available for the, after the event. Uh, uh, what's the approach to monitor SSD, UART, read, write speed? Um, I, that I don't know. Can't, uh. Uh, okay, is there any impact with harbor side if the wrong configuration on the DTS? Uh, yes, it is possible to blow up things. Um, the, uh, I would say is that you have to be very careful, like with example SD cards, that you don't uh, um, that you get the voltage right. Uh, that one you can cause a lot of damage. The same thing with uh, I would say SD cards is the biggest one I can think of off the top of my head. There's maybe something with PCIe too, but. Uh, Uh, is the Linux kernel willing mainline to accept proprietary board DTI? I think it's really more of a question if you want to, um, again, I, I haven't ever submitted a DTS to mainline, uh, but you're going to have to have a maintainer and it's going to have to, it's going to have to go through review. Um, there's not any reason to, uh, I think unless you're trying to have people leverage your design, uh, I think there's a lot of proprietary boards that have not made it to mainline. Uh, it's, that's what I was saying is that's why the uh, existing board design uh, discussion I was talking about. You have to be careful with that. Um, and okay, thank you for the nice words there. And uh, what is the purpose of hardware mod? Um, that one, uh, that's going away. I'll just put it that way. It's uh, with the latest kernel that are coming out. Uh, this is something, the purpose of hardware mod was to be able to help with the basically the power clocks management of the processor during bring up. Uh, okay, somebody says came back with simple bus means a simple memory about bus with no specific handling of the driver. Okay, I'm again. I I don't have a an answer for that one. Uh, okay, Drew mentioned I see it in device tree files for AM three three five eight. Um, hmm. I'll have to. Uh, I guess you must be talking about overlays. Um, I have to go back and look. Uh, do you have a vision on using USB on board standard bring up version SD card? Uh, mm, no, I don't have a. Uh, a version yet, or I guess that means version. Um, but um, I would, like I said, I usually was just cut and pasting in uh, nodes from an existing DTS file. I hope that answered that question. When using DC, create a DTS from a DTB. Have you ever found a tool that can create a DTS and add reference to the source of each device tree entry? Uh, no, I, not that I'm aware of. If I'm understanding the question, question correctly, can you find out which include file it came from? I don't think you, to my knowledge, I don't think you can because it's, it's just basically disassembling a, a big data, a big blob. And once it's uh, into that blob, you can't tell how it I guess, got into the blob. Are DTS files covered under, oh, that's a, I, that's a GPL v2. Are, are DTS files covered under the GPL B2 license or can they remain proprietary? Um, I, I guess that, that one I'd, I have to, you'd have to, I have to defer to getting legal advice on. I, I mean, it's, I don't know. I can't answer, I don't know that answer that one. Uh, okay. So somebody's asking, can you divide, uh, modify DT, uh, DT or device tray on the fly? Uh, the person's saying, yes, you can do it by blob. You can do it in the memory. So yes, you can. Uh, this person saying that they've done it before. 
uh, another. Um, okay, there's. Oh, somebody's telling me that you can uh, find a source file by using DTX diff annotated against the DTS file. Okay. okay I, haven't, I haven't really tried DTX diff before. I think I should probably look into that. All right, it looks like I've made it through the questions. Thank you very much. This has been uh, great. Um, and uh, just uh, to add just really fast, the, the last comment there from Frank Rowan, uh, he's the device tree maintainer. So <laughs> uh, his, his yeah. answer there is, is, uh, is the definitive one. So you can, in fact, yeah. figure out where things come from using his, his, uh, his Perl script there. Anyway, thank you very much, Skylar. It's been really great. Uh, it's been a, a wonderful uh, introduction to, uh, to device tree. And uh, uh, indeed, indeed uh, I'm sure we will refer to it uh, as we have with the other um, you know, talks from, from people like uh, Thomas Pezzoni and such. But yeah, the, the slides will be uploaded uh, after the talk. And uh, indeed, as I understand it, the, the videos will be available afterwards. Uh, I would uh, suggest checking back with the Q&A. Uh, you'll find that people will add more questions uh, even after the talk. I've actually just been adding some to mine uh, during your talk as well. So anyway, thank you very, very much, everybody. The next talk will be an I squared C and SPI this afternoon with Michael Welling and uh, Matt Porter will be giving a talk on uh, spelunking through reference manuals and schematics uh, at the at the end of the day, which will finish off our essential uh, embedded uh, track. So thank you very much, everybody for attending.